Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of DABCC Live. This is our second episode ever. I'm quite excited about this one. We have a great episode for you, and, and hopefully you guys were able to hit the first one with absence, and uh, uh, we had a lot of fun doing that. This is a a little bit different. My goal for these webinars or uh, series, the DABCC Live series, is a little bit different than um, you know a traditional webinar. Um, now it is a traditional webinar. We're going to have a little bit of PowerPoint for you, a lot of demo. Um, you know, I'm going to, but yet I'm going to sort of do my little thing, and that is ask some questions along the way, and also allow you guys to ask questions too. So please shoot us as many questions as possible. If we're not able to answer those questions throughout this uh, webinar, which if you guys ask a lot, we won't be able to answer them all, uh, but we'll definitely follow up with you guys and make sure that um, uh, you get you know answers to those. So uh, that being said, we're going to just wait a couple seconds here, uh, or maybe you know another couple minutes, and, and just let everyone get into the webinar, and then we'll go ahead and get started. But again, I want to thank everybody for attending, and then also uh, you know just thank you guys for attending, and definitely you know a big. Uh, sound is very low. We have a sound is very low. I wonder if we can turn that up at all. Let me see. This is what I love about these webinars. It's very informal. And if you guys have problems, definitely let me know. Uh, I just turned up my volume a little bit. Please let me know if that sounds better from the good old chat room out there. So, and, and again, that's what's neat about this, this format is we're going to try to do it very, um, you know, um, off the cuff and, and just allow you guys to um, you know be part of this this webinar, not just sitting out there listening. So definitely, uh, if you have any questions, if you have any uh, issues like the, the sound quality is poor or anything like that, definitely let me know. So on that note, um, what do you say we get started? Um, that's two of seven. Okay, we will. Sound good. Okay, good. So. What do we have for you today? Again, this is DABCC Live Episode 2, and I'm extremely happy to have the guys from a company called Eternity that makes a great solution called Frontline Performance Intelligence. And uh, it's, it's pretty neat stuff. So with no further ado, let's just dive directly into it. Um, I have two guys from Eternity with us. We have Trevor Matz, who's the president and CEO, and we have, uh, also have Edin Chokot, who is the Eternity's co-founder and their CTO. So um, we have the right guys here, and they're going to give us a little bit of an introduction to who these guys are, what they do, and then, uh, of course, into the demo itself. So I'm really excited about the demo because this is some neat stuff. So please ask your questions, and, uh, and let's get on with it. So um, real quick, uh, I want to do the uh, introductions real quick. So Trevor, can you tell us who you are and what do you do over at uh, Eternity? Yeah, hi, Daggett. As you said, we're, we're excited about being here with you on the ABCC Live and definitely going to be showing a lot of product and uh, keeping it informal. Everything will be live in terms of the demo. So I'm the president and CEO of the company, and I uh, try to keep us on track to implement and bring our vision of frontline performance intelligence to the market, and that's really what you're going to be hearing about and seeing for the next hour. Perfect, perfect. And then we also have Edin Shokat with us. Edin? Can you tell us who you are and what do you do over Eternity? Yeah, definitely. As you mentioned, my name is Edwin Shokat. I'm, as a co-founder, I'm uh, tasked with finding the vision, understanding what the customer needs are, build at least prototypes of the solution, and work with the research and development uh, group in order to materialize them into the product that you'll be seeing today. Well, perfect. Perfect. Okay. So um, let's just dive directly into it. Sound good, guys? Absolutely. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So, Trevor, can we begin just real quick by uh, you telling us a bit more, uh, bit more about what's happening within the IT industry and why there's a need for the new approach to APM? Yeah, sure. Some recent research over the last year and as recently as the last three months has surfaced some, some pretty amazing facts. And the first one that I, like, that I you know, find really staggering is from Forrester, and that's that with all the investment we've made in IT management and application performance management, 74% of the time, the first time that IT hears about a problem is when the user actually calls the help desk. And Intel had similar research that monetize that challenge by saying that 80% of IT desktop support budgets were spent really on identifying and then trying to resolve these end-user problems. 
So it really comes as no surprise that Aberdeen Group as recently as March of this year surveyed the Global 2000 and identified that the top three challenges for managing application performance today are around proactive IT management, detecting problems before users call the help desk, understanding the visibility, the empirical evidence of how users are experiencing the IT services they consume. And of course, that's really exacerbated today as we move to the virtual desktop environments, whether that be terminal services or Citrix or, or VDI, where the visibility into, those, into that experience is almost impossible to achieve via monitoring the network or CPU or I.O. or memory. And the third challenge was the inability to understand and measure the business impact of application performance related issues. Aberdeen found that 50% of revenue loss in the global 2000 could be attributed to poor performing applications. So clearly there's a, there's a tremendous challenge in the market space today about transforming IT organizations into proactive IT enterprises and providing the visibility of how the most important asset in that chain, that end user, is really experiencing those IT services. And if you think about it, it really doesn't come as a surprise why we have that problem today. Because over the last 15 or even 20 years, we've been very successful in closing the visibility gap from a data center centric IT perspective. So we have good instrumentation of our network infrastructure and our app servers, our database servers, our middleware, our hosts and our application servers. And as a result of that, most of the global 2000 or definitely the Fortune 500 will report data center uptime around the 99.7 or 99.8% of the time. And we've really got a good handle on that. The problem, of course, that we all face is that the user-centric component of that ecosystem is clearly not covered. And there's really no visibility into how those users themselves are experiencing, this, that the, experiencing those services. And if you think about that, that's the user performance, his latency, his response time, his end-to-end -end transaction time, the productivity of the user, how productive is he with this application on this desktop, on this desktop with a better, with, with, with better infrastructure, on this virtual desktop, in another virtual environment, etc. So all around the real end user experience component, that's really where the visibility gap exists today. And what Eternity does is address that gap and close that gap by delivering the industry's first frontline performance intelligence platform. And what that does is fundamentally transform every desktop, real or virtual, into a self-monitoring platform that's user experience aware. And when you talk about virtualization and virtualized desktops, you've got all this finger pointing going on that the performance is now poor because of virtualization or concern about introducing virtualized environments because of the impact on the performance because there's really no empirical way to truly understand how those users are performing and using the system. And that's really what frontline performance intelligence is all about, and that's really what I'm going to speak about and demonstrate to you um, for, for the rest of the hour. Well, that sounds great. That sounds great. So um, let's talk a bit about more about frontline performance intelligent, intelligence. What exactly is frontline performance intelligence? Well, really, frontline performance, to, to, to define, I think, frontline performance intelligence, we really first have to define what true real end user experience. And, and that concept is bandied around in the market today by many, many vendors because that really is the pain point and the urgent need of most organizations. So I think the place to start in defining FPI is to define real end user experience. So let's think about what does it mean, real end user experience. The real end user experience is comprised of three components that dynamically interact at all times to both define and impact how users experience these IT services. Of course, the first one is application performance. And application performance means any application, a web application, a rich internet application written you know, in Ajax, a Java application, a stick client, a Win32 application, any application. And of course, the application performance at the level of the business transaction or business process workflow or what we call an activity because that's really what users are doing. So to understand the first component of end user experience, what we need to understand is how those users 
are experiencing the response time, the latency, the availability of the fundamental units of work that they execute, which are those business processes or activities. Now, the problem is that even if you've got a well-performing application from an infrastructure perspective, if the platform that that application is executing on is causing poor performance, whether that be because of CPU or memory or the swap file or a multitude of other reasons, and of course in the, in the, in the virtualized environment because of overcapacity, too many guest machines on a particular host, too many sessions connecting to a Citrix server, the impact the negative impact of that performance on that application will be huge. So although the application itself and its infrastructure is performing well, obviously the desktop performance has a tremendous impact on how that user experiences that app. And the third component really is of, of end user experience is, is productivity. So how productive is that user executing that application? Because in the end of the day, the, the platform might be great, the app might be great, but if the user can't use it well, he can't execute his work, he can't do what he needs to do, the experience will be really poor. And just think about it for all of us who've moved from Outlook 2003 and Office 2003 to 2007, you know, the change was dramatic. And just trying to find our way around the ribbon and find the features that we'd all worked for, worked with for, you know, for many, many years became a challenge. And of course, the same thing applies when we upgrade from SAP and Siebel to the new versions and whatever other custom apps. So it's really those three components that dynamically interact to define how the user is experiencing those services. And what frontline performance intelligence is, is the result of the real-time aggregation, analysis, and correlation of all of those metrics that together define end user experience to deliver what we call real-time or right-time business intelligence. And that's all about proactive IT management, detecting problems before users call the help desk, isolating who the impacted users are, isolating which are the impacted servers, the, the target servers, the Citrix servers, the VDI boxes, understanding what the probable cause is, understanding the business impact, who is impacted by this problem, by role, by geography, by location, by business unit. It's all about the intelligence for evaluating, planning, and managing desktop virtualization projects, which is the appropriate desktop virtualization platform for my organization with my particular set of applications? What's the best host guest to host ratio? What is the maximum amount of sessions I can run on a particular terminal services box before performance becomes impacted? Usage-based software license optimization, so all capacity planning. So what frontline performance intelligence does is take all of these metrics around how users are experiencing, using, executing their applications harnessing their desktop environment and transforms all of that in real time into intelligence to arm IT and business management to make proactive and preemptive business decisions and transform their organizations into proactive IT enterprises. So that's really at a high level what, you know, what frontline performance intelligence is all about. Make sense? Absolutely, absolutely. So can you explain the Eternity uh, uh, platform and how it works in a virtualized environment to us a bit more? And maybe give us just a bit more info? Absolutely. Let me, let me just give you a, a quick high-level overview of the company itself. It was founded in 2004. There's probably over today over 150, almost 200 man years of development in the platform. We're headquartered here in Boston. Um, our R&D facilities are in Tel Aviv. We have, offices in, we have an office in New York as well. And really what the, what the vision of the company is all about is about transforming application performance management technology into a strategic business enabler. Enabler for both the IT operations, the help desk, the application owners, the application engineers, et cetera, around really these three primary areas of preemptive problem detection, this comprehensive view of end user experience, and you know, these empirical metrics for, for right time decision support. So to really answer your question is, how does this really work? Let me show you three slides of an overview starting at the top level architecture, drilling down a little bit further of how the, the platform is comprised. And with, with that as the background, we can jump straight into a demo, shut down PowerPoint, and just spend the next 40 minutes looking at the product. So from a platform perspective, the platform is a service-oriented architecture with a message-oriented middleware backbone comprised of four loosely coupled but tightly integrated services. And the first service is the data collection service. And that's implemented by the Microsoft Certified Secure Eternity Agent, 
that sit on the desktops, real and virtual. So on the physical desktops, the Citrix servers, the Microsoft terminal services, and of course the VMware VDI boxes. And those agents take about 0.2% CPU utilization on average, about 0.6 to 0.8% at peak, negligible impact on, obviously, on the underlying um, desktop itself. And what they're able to do is monitor everything about that endpoint, everything about the desktop performance of that endpoint, everything about the application performance of that endpoint, all the way, obviously, down to the transactional level, and everything around the productivity, the application usage, and usability of that endpoint. And it does that passively, and sends out data every minute, which on average takes about five to eight bytes per second of network bandwidth, so intangible impact on the bandwidth, and sends that to the next tier, which is the aggregation service, which will aggregate data from multiple endpoints and send that off to the management service. The management service is responsible for persisting the data in the database, for the integration of the platform with the directory servers, or services to get the, the, the role information, the departmental information, with your trouble ticketing systems, your remedy, your CA service center, your peregrine, your other management systems, your notification systems like email. And the crown jewel of the system is the analytics service, which runs real-time multi-threaded against the database and generates these performance baselines, these statistical models of normative performance against which preemptive or proactive problem detection is accomplished, the automatic isolation of the impacted apps, the impacted transactions, the impacted users, and of course the identification of the probable cause, and all the smarts of the system is implemented you know, via the analytics server. Now, in a small implementation, which for us is up to about 5,000 endpoints, all three of those top-level services, the aggregation, analytic, and management service, can run on a single dual CPU Wintel box. But because of a service-oriented architecture with the, middle, with the message-oriented middleware backbone, the system can scale massively to support tens of thousands of endpoints. So that's sort of on a, on a high-level architectural view. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So in a, in a virtual environment, I think you already answered this question, but in a virtual environment, how does uh, the Eternity solution generate the real-time analytics? Okay. So first of all, let's look very quickly at the monitoring component of the agent. What you can see is the agent is comprised of a set of plugins or cartridges which allows this agent passively to instrument every aspect of the operating system from the event log through WMI. The processes allows the users themselves to write their own scripts to monitor any component of, of, of the desktop. And then these application cartridges which allow us and our users, our end users, our service partners to instrument any application out of the box, whether that be AJAX or HTTP, thick client, Win32, Java, etc., while monitoring, of course, the latency with full support for both RDP and ICA. We're actually a licensee of the ICA protocol, as well as being able to monitor all the network and IO traffic in and out of the endpoint. So that's how we accomplish the monitoring, and that's a huge part of our IP to do that non-invasively, taking it you as know, 0.2%. CPU utilization. But the exciting part starts with the real-time analytics because all of these metrics are then sent to the management service in real time every minute, and the management service starts to analyze this data on multiple, vari on multiple, various, on multiple levels of, of, of analytics. But from a baseline perspective, in terms of understanding normative performance, the first thing that the analytics server will do is generate a performance baseline for every transaction that is being performed in that organization for every application that's being used. And that takes about four to 5,000 measurements. It can take a day, it can take a couple of hours. But within a maximum of about three days, there's a baseline for every transaction for every application that an organization is using. And then automatically, via regression, the baseline starts to get Split. In other words, the system recognizes that there are performance metrics associated with groups of users that share con common contextual information, like they're from the same location, or within the same location, they are from different subnets, and will automatically split those baseline by location by subnet. We'll then see that within a particular location or subnet, users that have a particular configuration of a machine have different performance. So it will further totally automated, split that baseline by 
identify the configuration information. And you can add LDAP to find the information like the role, the group, the user, etc. and it will split the baseline by that. So by the end of the day, what you have is you have a baseline by application, by transaction, by subnet, by user defined, um, L L LDAP component, by configuration, etc. by time. And as soon as performance will exceed that baseline, will deviate from that baseline, automatically the system will detect problems, isolate the users, et cetera. And these analytics you'll see are used in a variety of different ways throughout the system, but that's really you know, a, a quick overview of, sort of the high-level proactive IT, IT management aspect. And I'm gonna be demonstrating this to you live as we create and generate problems, detect them here in our lab environment um, you know, throughout, the, throughout this webinar. Perfect, perfect. Now I have a, a one question I'd like to ask real quick. And that is, you know, uh, I've been in the server base, a lot of us out there listening have been in the server based computing world and the virtual virtualization world for as long as it's been around. And, and we all know that uh, things like CPU and memory and net network utilization aren't always uh, the best measurement for performance in these environments. So I have to ask you the question, why are traditional metrics like CPU, memory, and network utilization not true measurements for performance in server based computing, Citrix, you know, and VD? environments yeah I mean that, that's a great question we have Ed and Shokat on, on the line and Ed and I wrote a white paper last year that really addressed this called optimizing virtual reality and I'm going to hand this question over to Ed and, and, and let Ed and, uh, participate and answer of course of course yeah it's a highly recommended white paper and I'm not tooting our own horn uh, but I think the very basic thing that ESX, VMware, or Zen, or Hyper-V do, the very first thing is overutilizing whatever is available on the machine in order to provide better service for each of the virtual machines running on the host system. So the hypervisor, by definition, will over-allocate memory. So when you have 100% memory allocation for a given VM, it will reallocate that same amount or potentially even two to three, four times to other virtual machines. So when you see a memory metric that says 100% utilization, in reality it can mean 20, 25, or 30, and you will not be able to gain any insight by seeing how much memory is allocated, unlike in a physical environment. Same thing, or even worse, goes for CPU. And the reason is that CPU is not a linear mechanism. So when uh, the CPU is a 20%, as I'm sure all of you would love your server-based computing environment to be in, it's, it can be a good experience, but if that same VDI client is hypervised to, and has 20%, it can mean that uh, the host machine is over-allocated, so this machine only gets the 20%. Same goes for 80%. It can be that this specific machine is at 80%, but the overall host is at 10, 15, or 20%. So you have a higher or lower density that you can do on that host machine, but you don't have the information. And what we discovered at customers is that the only metric that really mattered uh, for them to determine whether they can put 10, 20, 30, 40 VMs on a given host machine serving via a broker, a um, VDI farm, is what kind of user experience are users getting? How long does it take to send an email? How long does it take to submit a form in SAP? and compare that to a baseline. If you're still within range, you can increase the density on the machine and reduce CapEx. If it's outside of the uh, baseline that is determined, you know that users are suffering. It could be that it's not good enough trigger just yet for you to say that you would like to reduce the density, but it's the information you need to know that while you reduce the cost for the enterprise, you maintain a good level of service for the users. Well, sounds good. Sounds good. So, <clears throat> let's let's see it. All right. So let's get rid of the PowerPoint. We'll come back if we have some time for some additional PowerPoint slides and some more of the pearls that that Edna will share with you. But in the meantime, let's go and actually look at the product. So this is all live, and one never wants to do a webinar and demo anything live. So uh, we're going to just go for this ride, all of us together. So let's start with having a look at the product. Uh, you can see the main menu at the top of the product, and I think the first view that makes sense for us to look at is to look at the list of the endpoints. You can see in the mini dashboard at the top of the screen that there are 523 endpoints that are currently reporting in our lab environment. Most of them are, are VDI boxes and Citrix servers with robots, 
and you can see the number of problems that are currently open. There's zero critical problems, there are zero major and zero minor problems. The view that I've taken you to first is what's called the endpoint view. So here you can see the list of the 525 endpoints that are registered in the system of which 523 are reporting. And you can see that for each user, you can see the integration with the LDAP, the username, the host name, the location of that user, the department, the office, of course, they're subbing at the IP address, whether they are reporting or not reporting, you can see that they're all reporting live. And you can see the type of endpoint. So this, the endpoint icon, of course, over here represents the servers, and the endpoint icon over here represents the workstations. So when we talk about a server, it makes no difference to us if it's a Citrix server using ICA or it's a VDI server using RDP. It's all, it's all exactly the same. So let's drill down into our first Citrix server over here. We're going to use our New York server because we're all Boston Red Sox guys, so we're going to create all the problems on our, on our, on our Citrix New York server. Let's drill down into the New York server and look at a little bit of information about, about that server itself. And the first thing that we will see is we come up with a performance overview. And the performance overview gives us an immediate indication of the currently running applications. You can see in the lab we're running this retail brokerage, obviously the Citrix Zen app servers, Microsoft Outlook, and a clinical manager healthcare application. And you would see what the indicators are, if they're green, if they're red, and we'll immediately identify if there are problems with those applications. You can drill down in that and we'll show you a little bit of that, of that later. But what I wanted to really show you here is if we go to the application connection, what we immediately see are all of the endpoints that are connected to this Citrix ICA New York server. So look over here, remember Kyla, because we'll be looking at some of Kyla's metrics a little bit later on, and we can see who's actually connected to the server. If we look at the performance history of the server, what we will see is the actual performance for the application and the business transactions that are running at, on that particular Citrix server. So we have the retail brokerage application that's running. There are three business activities or transactions that are being executed via these Citrix connected users on that server. And we can see in five minute intervals the aggregated performance for their response time, the end-to-end -end transaction time, their latency, and if there have been any availability problems. And if we mouse over any one of the metrics, we can actually see the users that are receiving this level of performance. Well, if we take another Citrix server just as an example, we can see some instrumentation on this Citrix server that's quite interesting as well. Here for the performance history, we can look at the actual performance of the fundamental vitals of that Citrix server, its clock speed, its CPU usage, its percent idle time, its processing time, its memory usage. Now I'm using the, um, the, the, video ca the video projector in our room, so it sort of cuts the screen off a little bit, so just excuse me that some of these things over here you can see our, um, our, our, the, the columns are a little bit smaller because the, uh, the video projector actually reduces the size of the screen. So you can see over here the fundamentals of the performance of the actual Citrix box itself. You can also see the processes that are running on that Citrix box. And of course, search for any one of the processes. Here we can search for 180. These are the, this is the Eternity agent that's running on that particular server. We can see the inventory or the installed applications on that server, and we can see what we call the endpoint attributes of that server, which are really these fundamental contextuals about the CPU, the memory, the location, et cetera, et cetera, that they're running. So that's really the first perspective of the system is in terms of those endpoints and how they're actually collecting data all the time and how we can get immediate access to, um, to look at any of the fundamentals. But if we really want to see how the, um, the performance looks like for these users, we're going to want to take a look at the performance navigator. So let's have a look at the performance navigator. The, uh, the browser window loves to keep showing up. Let me see if I can make him disappear. There we go. Now the performance navigator is the tool in the product that uh, provides us with the real-time visualization of all of these metrics and allows us to slice and dice this information any which way we want. And you'll see that there are multiple views. There's a troubleshooting view for quick analysis. There's a navigation view which allows us to build different drill downs. And there's a repository view where we can save any drill down we've done 
and view it later. So let's go ahead and take a look at, um, at how this would work. So when we, the first thing we want to select is the filter, and we can filter this by application response, by latency, by host resources. Let's look at application latency, and let's look at application latency of the Citrix Zen app of the ICA. As soon as we do that, what you see is that dynamically the host table gets populated, and all servers that are using ICA show up in that table. And if we click on any one of those Citrix servers, automatically the host table or the user table gets filtered by the users that are connected to that Citrix server. And if I search over here for, um, if I, if, actually before I search, let me show you. And if I generate this view, what you will see here is the actual latency by minute for every one of the users that are accessing that Citrix server, so they're getting almost a half a millisecond of latency, as well as the number of requests, the volume, the count, the activity level of these endpoints to, to, the actual, um, to, to, to that actual Citrix server itself. Now, what we're looking here is just the latency between the physical endpoint and the Citrix server. What we also want to see, of course, is the performance from that Citrix server to the backend application itself, and what is the response time between the between the, Citrix, the desktop between the Citrix and the target server executing those business activities? So let's change our view over here to application response. Let's select an application. These are all the applications that are instrumented. Let's take our retail brokerage application. It's a web-based app. There's Java applications here. There's Win32 applications. Let's select the retail brokerage app. Automatically what happens is that the system shows us the destination servers that are servicing those requests from those Citrix servers. And if we turn now to the chart view and we generate, what we will see over here, let's actually take a particular, let's take a, a, a particular, a particular backend server and let's actually that will automatically filter for the, for the users. And now what we'll actually see is the performance of open account, for example, for a particular user accessing that, that retail backend server. If we go and search here for Kyla, oh, no, actually, I don't want to do that. You see, this is what happens when you, when, when you, when you, do, it, when you do it live. I think we want to look at this server, which is the problem. There we go. Let's look at Kyla. So that is Kyla. You can see that Kyla is accessing the claim retail server via that ICA New York Citrix server. And if we select Kyla, we can see that Kyla's response time for those three primary business activities that she's performing are all between one and a half to two and a half seconds. And you can see that in the last hour, she has performed those activities each 58 times. Of course, Kyla is a robot. She gives no, doesn't talk back and she just executes these activities all the time. So very, very quickly, we can, go into, we can go into the system, identify any Citrix server, any backend server, any user, and see their performance for the last hour, the last minute, the last day, the last week, and compare their performance metrics with their peers, with, the, with, with different backend infrastructure itself. So what you're seeing over here from a virtualized environment is what you're seeing now is that Kyla had latency of about a half a millisecond between, between her desktop and the, and, and the Citrix server, the ICA New York Citrix server, and you can see that she's getting approximately on average between 1.2 to 2.2 seconds response time, end-to-end -end transaction time for each one of the business transactions or business activities that she is executing across across this application. Does, does that make sense, Doug? Absolutely, absolutely. So <clears throat> I'd like to ask a, a question. How does, um, how does attorney prevent IT from being blamed for poor user experience then? You know, that's, one of, our, that's one of the big problems, right? You know, finger pointing, blah, 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 blah. Absolutely. We, we hear that all the time. And, you know, the, the antidote, I think, um, you know, for, for finger pointing is really all about empirical data analysis, you know, obviously adequate capacity planning, but the ability to have the data itself and to identify the performance and compare that performance and identify the outliers 
That, I think, is the most powerful antidote for finger pointing because it's the lack of, of real empirical data but only anecdotal water cooler information. It was slow today. It seemed slower here when I was working on a real desktop. It was better. Now it's not as good, et cetera, et cetera. That's really, you know, the biggest problem of finger pointing. So the answer to that is to be able to have the empirical data in real time at all times and say, you know, this is really what's going on. So then I'm going to show you a little bit about that, how, how you could, how an organization could help, could, could, could protect itself from the finger pointing, um, comparing performance for this application running on a real versus a, a virtual desktop. Before I show you that, and I, and I transition to that, you see the little icon over here of the diskette. What you can do is any one of these queries or filters can be saved. And once they're saved, you can go into the repository and you can execute these filters from the repository. So I've built four or five queries for our demo that I think will highlight some of the core components of the system itself. And the very first one is this real versus desktop, real versus virtual desktop comparison. What you can see is we're comparing the performance of this retail brokerage application, three business activities on the different platforms, the real versus the virtual platforms. So if we execute this query, I think I'm going to run out of time, so I'm going to just pick it up a little bit. If we execute this query, what we will see is that the performance of all three of these activities is actually slightly better on the virtual desktop environment than it is on the real desktop environment. And if we drill down on that virtual desktop environment, we can see that open account is almost 100% slower than the search customer, but the open customer, but the, that has nothing to do with the performance of the, of the Citrix server or the, or the VDI server, and we can actually drill down and we'll see that the performance of all of these five Citrix servers are all performing consistently across the board. And actually, the performance that the users are getting are better than they are getting on a real, on a real desktop. Let's go back and look at that. Open account in our virtual environment is taking two minutes and 31 seconds. If we go back and we look at that on our real desktops, we see it's taking two minutes and 41 seconds. Now, of course, these are robots and the metrics are pretty homogenous, but clearly that is the very best way to eliminate and obliterate finger pointing because you can show for any application what the performance of that application is by Citrix server, by target server versus a real desktop, etc., and actually drill down to the level of the users themselves and see what the physical actual users, what their performance is. You can see that the performance of these users is actually worse than the performance that the users are getting from their actual, from their, from their, from their Citrix server. And we can take a slightly additional view of that by looking at another application, in this case, a clinical manager application with five, five different business activities, and actually do a comparison of the performance by location, by target server, by virtualization server, and by user. Give you a slightly different view and a slightly different flavor. Let's look, let's look at that together. So what you see in the first graph is here you're seeing the performance of five business activities across five different locations. So you can see that the business activities are performing consistently across all the locations. Clearly create customer, create patient search is performing more poorly than the others, but it is consistent across the different locations. And if we drill down, for example, into add patient document, which is taking, say, 2.81 seconds in Wilmington, if we drill down, we can see that the performance for add patient document across all locations is consistent. What we do see, though, immediately is that Citrix Server 003 is providing the worst performance for that same business activity, Citrix Server 001 better, and Citrix Server 002 the best. And if we click down on that Citrix Server and look at this from a simple column perspective, what we can see immediately visualized in front of us that for ad patient documents in Wilmington, users that are accessing Citrix Server 003 are having the poorest experience. So there again, is, here is a case where a, where a particular Citrix server is performing more poorly than another one. The other Citrix servers are performing well. Immediate identification and re remediation of that. And if you wanted to know, for example, which users are accessing Citrix server 003, in other words, who are the impacted users, who are suffering from that, we can drill down into that. And of course, now we'll see the list 
of all the actual users. So when the users actually call the help desk, the help desk is immediately aware that Adrian is getting three second response time for a patient document and an ER response time above one and a half seconds is not acceptable and he has the empirical evidence to look at that immediately. So to summarize, I think your question, Doug, is that the empirical evidence of the performance of both real and virtual desktop really is the number one obliterator or terminator of questions that arise regarding virtual environments. And in addition, when there are problems, when there is poor performance, whether it's because of the location or the subnet or the Citrix server, you can immediately isolate what the cause of that problem is. And although sometimes these problems occur after we've introduced new environments, very often they're not necessarily related to the new environment, and you can immediately see by target server, by user, by location, by role, you know, by physical desktop, you know, exactly what is, what is going on. Does that make sense? Absolutely, absolutely. I have a question from the audience here for you. So um, let me make sure I read this properly. Uh, are your monitoring agents for Windows, or are there monitor, monitor if I can spit this word out, are there monitoring agents for Windows OS only, or do you have agents for Solaris and other OSs that integrate into one's enterprise monitoring solution? Yeah, so we're obviously monitoring the endpoints, and obviously 95% of, 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 the, of the workstations out there are Windows 2000 all the way through to Windows 7, and we, we support everything through Vista and in the next quarter supporting Windows 7 as well. And of course, the virtual desktops, the Citrix, the terminal services, and the, um, the, the VDI boxes. So our agents are, are, are Windows specific because we're actually monitoring the endpoints. We don't have agents on the back end infrastructure. We're able to do all of this by monitoring from the frontline perspective itself. If the question, if the, if the, if the person is asking, the question is, is asking in terms of desktop environments that are running non-Windows environment, non-Windows operating systems like Linux, we haven't announced anything, but stay tuned and, um, and watch our website. Perfect, perfect. And then definitely, guys out there, ask your questions. So within the little um, sidebar here of uh, GoToWebinar, there's a little area for questions. So feel free to ask questions, and we'll get to them. So I have another question from me, and that is, uh, how, does the Eternity, how does the Eternity, you guys, the solution, uh, provide organizations with the ability to be pre um, preemptive in fixing and eliminating business disruptions? Well, that's a great question, and that's really, you know, at the apex of our value pyramid, the ability to transform organizations from reactive IT enterprises into, you know, proactive IT organizations. So let me show you, and I think that's sort of, you know, the most exciting part of, of what I'm going to demo for you. I want to look at it from two perspectives. One is from a sort of a, a more of a medium to long-term perspective. In other words, identifying performance outliers uh, to for preemptive remediation. In other words, being able to have an enterprise view and see where things are a little bit off target, where they're not performing well, obviously before the users call the help desk, and identify those kind of outliers. And then talk about sort of real-time problem detection, and that's really what, uh, what, what, what we'll end up with. So let me talk about, first of all, about this uh, preemptive remediation, looking for these outliers. One of the key fundamentals of, of, of our IP is what we call the universal performance indicator. And what this universal performance indicator is, is an advanced statistical model that's able to normalize performance metrics across different business activities, different transactions. Obviously, preview email takes a lot less than opening an email. And obviously, going into your inbox takes a lot less time than scheduling a meeting. So those metrics are all different. And if you want to compare the overall performance, let's say, for Outlook in location A with location B, you need an ability to normalize all those metrics so that you can compare the overall performance. And that's really what UPI does. It's very, very powerful. And what you can see over here is we're looking at universal performance indicator and looking at that in terms of this clinical manager application. And at a glance, what we see is that Wilmington is the worst performing location that we have. Let me explain to you what this graph actually shows you because it, it, it's, it's really powerful stuff. What you see is the 50 percentile shows you the normal performance, the average, not the normal, the average performance that that organization is getting. So anything that is sitting around the 50 percentile shows you that they are experiencing average performance for that organization. 
the bigger the bubble means the more activity is, that is happening in that particular location, the number of transactions, the volume of transactions. To the left of the 50 percentile means performance is better than average. To the right, it's worse. Up the axis on the left is the variability, which means what is the level of variability of the performance? Is it consistent or is there a high level of variability? And what you can see at Wilmington is that performance is the worst out of all of the five locations for our application. It's got the highest and it has the highest level of variability and average volume, obviously Las Vegas is the biggest volume, but as opposed to the other four, its, it's, it's volume is average. And I'm not going to go through the drill downs, but you could then drill down from Wilmington and understand what is, which applications are being impacted in, in Wilmington and then which business activities are being Im impacted in Wilmington. And as a result, why are those activities being impacted? In other words, which are the target servers, both the virtualized servers and the, and, and the last top servers that are associated with the poor performance in Wilmington? So that's the first thing that the UPI allows you to do is take an organizational view and look at your entire organization by location, by application, and then sort of preemptively drill down to understand what is causing the outlier, the outlier performance. But the real crown jewel of the system is to be able to detect problems proactively when they occur before the users call the help desk. And what you see over here in this drill down is the performance of the latency of all our Citrix servers over time. And what you can see is that at 14.30, at 2.30, the performance for the Texas Citrix server spiked from being on average about 10 milliseconds all the way up to 70 milliseconds. And what you can see over here is that immediately two problems have actually been opened in our system. And let's look at that. So what happened is performance deviated from the norm, and the utility system automatically detected that a problem was occurring. Here we can see at 237, the spike started at about 233, 234. At 237, the system detected that there was a problem, that there were 20 endpoints that were impacted. At the height of the problem, there were 20, the maximum amount of, impa of, of, of endpoints impacted was 20, and you can see that the system has already classified the problem. If we drill down on that problem, the system will show us the impact analysis. So what you can see is that, that what, is, what is the monitored attribute here that is being impacted is the latency. You can see that the number of endpoints that, have been, that, that are impacted by this problem are 20. You can see also that the threshold detection has kicked in as well because we'll detect both by manual threshold and by baseline. So the first monitored attribute is the baseline latency. The second monitored attribute is the threshold performance that we set for this demo, that if it exceeded that threshold, it would be detected. You can see the grouping of these symptoms that only opens up a single problem, and we can identify that 20 out of the 80 users are impacted, and we can see that the impact is not in a single location. It's actually across three different locations. So immediate identification of the problem, what is impacted, in this case it's Citrix latency, what is the business impact? Who are the users that are impacted? How many users are impacted and across which locations? Then, of course, we want to know who are the impacted endpoints. The system will automatically identify, and there's our friend Kyla, will automatically identify which endpoints have been impacted. And, of course, because you can search by location, by department, by role, you've got immediate understanding of the business impact of that. The system will show you the problem chart, and there you can see that at just almost 2.30 p.m., the performance started to spike, and the problem was automatically detected at 2.37, and the problem was open. And then comes the real magic, and that's the probable cause. The understanding of the system to take all of those attributes that are monitored and identify what is unique and common of this impacted group, and in this case, the only uniquely common identifier of which there's a 100% match is that they are all using this ICA New York server that we're seeing over here. So 20 out of 20 of the users using that Citrix server are impacted. Now look at this, this is interesting. On subnet 172.100, 17 out of the 17 users are impacted. So you would think that that's a 100% hit as well. What we show you is that there are 15% of the users on that subnet that are not impacted. So 
So just by chance, 85% of the users on that subnet are having a problem. But the reason they're having a problem has got nothing to do with that subnet. The reason they're having a problem is because they're all connected to a particular Citrix server. This can reduce, of course, the triage and the probable cause that IT goes through literally by hours. And of course, the business disruption, the, the reduction of the business disruption, you know, is, is the key value proposition over here. You can see as well the location, you know, as well as, as well thrown into here. Now, the system monitors the problem life cycle of the problem. It's not just that it detects the problem and classifies it, it monitors the problem throughout its life cycle. So you can see at 237 it was detected, you can see that it, the threshold detection kicked in at 239, and you can see that the classification, the probable cause was identified three minutes later from the time that the problem occurred. So by the time the users call the help desk, IT knows when the problem started, who's impacted, what the cause is, and IT operations are already on the problem, and hopefully it will be resolved before the users are even aware. Now, when the problem disappears, when performance reverts back to its normal level, automatically you'll see that at the end of the demo, the system will automatically close the problem. Now, because the system is integrated with your travel ticketing systems and whatever other notification mechanisms you have, you'll get notified by email, by SMS that a problem has occurred. The system will open up a problem in your travel ticketing system, will update the problem throughout its life cycle, and will finally close it. The last thing I want to show you on this detection scenario is the problem report that is automatically generated and then distributed by email to whoever would be on the distribution list. So here what would happen, whether you don't have to be sitting and monitoring the platform for this to happen, this report will be automatically generated, it gets an ID, it tells you when the problem was detected, you can see the problem has not been resolved, the problem is still open, what the number of impacted endpoints were at the, at the time of the problem and the, and, the, and the maximum impact, the graph of that impact, it will then show you the number of impacted endpoints over time. So what's happened? How many people have been impacted? Are people starting to drop off? They, they stopped using the app because it's unusable. It will tell you what the affected applications or attributes are, show you what the probable cause analysis is of that problem, and then identify the organizational impact, the departments that are impacted, the host names that are impacted, the locations, the subnets, and the actual users. And of course, this is automatically automatically distributed to all of the users in the system. I know we're running out of time, and I do have a lot more, a lot more to show you, but probably it's better to go back to the, to the PowerPoint and, uh, and, and, and close off. Well, if you, if you don't and, mind. And well, if we want to, we can also, um, if, if we are right at the, the 3 o'clock um, in, in time, but uh, if, we, if you guys are up for it, maybe we just stick around and continue on a little bit. Allow people, if they'd like, you can definitely jump off if you have other appointments, uh, other calendar events, things like that. We are also recording this, so you can download this at a, at a later time and listen to its, it in its entirety. But, you know, no reason to stop a good thing, right? All right, great. I'm, I'm totally game for it, so let, let me keep going. I'm going to show you one more, one more detection scenario around, not about, not around latency, but really about end-to-end -end response time, a problem that we all have, we're all users of Outlook, many of us. So here is a problem that was detected, you can see at 2.43 this afternoon, and this is a problem where the monitored attribute is not latency, but it's the activity response, the end-to-end -end execution time of that open email. And once again, you can see about a third of the users, 106 of them are impacted, again, impact across two different subnets, two different locations. We can go, once again, see the impacted endpoints, and here we can go and we can actually drill down into one of these impacted endpoints. And what we will see for these impacted endpoints is the red notification that there's a problem with all users in all locations, and we can look at the performance history for that particular user, what the Outlook performance history looked like. We can see the workflow of the user, the minute by minute, usage of that, and if we actually go here and search this by activity, actually by duration, what we will see is that the performance for these Outlook activities are what's actually being, what's actually being impacted. And we can see the problem chart as we saw beforehand over here. Once again, the, the, the deviation of the problem, you can see the problem caught way, way before the deviation hit, hit its max, and once again, to automatically identify the probable cause 
associated with this. And what the system is doing now is taking all of these attributes for these 105 impacted endpoints and comparing everything to all other impacted users. And here you can see that the problem, the probable cause of this problem in this case is that the exchange server itself is the problem. So what we've seen is detection on latency, detection on response time, the system will detect against availability, automatic isolation of impacted users and impacted sessions, automatic isolation of the probable cause, and then the full problem life cycle and the problem history. And what will happen now is uh, we will now turn the robot back to the normative performance. You will see that the system will automatically close these problems after 10 to 15 minutes of part of normative performance, automatically close these problems both in the trouble ticketing system and in our, in our own platform. So from a demo perspective, I, I hope I touched on most of the high points um, and back to you, Doug. Well, that sounds good. That sounds good. So is there, you know, we're right at time, so my whole script, not that I really necessarily have a script, but, you know, my, my thoughts are all thrown out the window now. So what else would you like to show us? Um, I know there's a little bit more PowerPoint. Um, would you like to show that? Um, what else would you like to show us? I think from a high-level demo perspective, I mean, there's so much more to show in the platform itself, and I think just to jump, jump around wouldn't really be helpful. I think the best probably would be to summarize what we've sort of seen today, because I have fed you all with a, you know, with a fire hose. And I think the message of frontline performance intelligence specifically for the virtualization environment is really the ability to have the empirical data, the empirical evidence, to identify the true performance, the true experience of those users, eliminate the finger pointing, and then pre preemptively and proactively identify when there are problems, what the causes of the problems are, is it really the virtualized environment, is it really the infrastructure, the infrastructure, understand probable cause, and, and really support the evaluation, the planning, and the long-term management of these virtualized environments, because that's really where we started. You know, today, we can't use the same tools and technologies to monitor the environment and the infrastructure that we've used for the past because they just don't apply in the virtualized environment. And the best metric we can use is this, is this experiential data. And, and the best experiential data is to truly understand the performance of both the desktop, the platform, the application, and the productivity of the user to really ensure that our virtualization projects are successful and that they, they won't be, at the end of the day, concern or fear of moving this environment or finger pointing because you've moved in this environment. And I think that's really what I've, what, what I've tried to present and, and, and summarize today. We did have a couple more, um, a couple more screenshots, of, um, a couple more slides, and I would like to maybe just hand over to, to Eden for, um, for five minutes to close. I think the people are still on the go, too, so they're, they're hanging in there with us. So thank you all for, for hanging in with us. And maybe just talk a little bit about um, the informed capacity planning from the desktop virtualization add -in, and then speak about the, the, uh, the three or four different virtualization environments, the terminal services, the VDI, and the desktop virtualization, and, and where our benefits are in each of those environments to close. I think that would be a good close, Doug. That sounds good. That sounds good. And then I definitely have a couple questions that I want to ask you guys before we call it a, a uh, webinar. Sure. Yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Uh, apologies. I was uh, muting. So, with informed capacity planning, I touched very briefly uh, on that uh, when we talked. Trevor hasn't uh, shown much of our capabilities around the desktop virtualization, the informed capacity planning. So, if we look right now on the screen, the day to day of understanding what kind of density can a given infrastructure provide for my users while maintaining the same level of service that I've been providing them so far and comparing it across the different environments because that's a challenge when you are locked in by a single vendor. When someone comes to you, when your uh, vendors come to you and tell you that Citrix is the best solution, that Citrix uh, Zen app is the best solution or that uh, RDP be it uh, Microsoft themselves or secondary vendors that utilize the protocol, whether VDI is the right approach and stream it uh, via RDP or ICA, or maybe new platforms like Project Independence by Citrix and uh, the new view uh, paradigm by VMware, all of these have their own benefits, but the net effect is what kind of cost 
can you justify and what kind of capabilities will the platform offer? And that's exactly what you're seeing here is being able to uh, quantitatively understand what kind of performance will you get on each of those platforms and what kind of density uh, will you be able to perform on the same spec of servers across the different virtualization types with your applications. And that's an important distinction because every application responds differently to a different virtualization technology. Some virtualization technologies are very I.O. unfriendly. Some virtualization technologies are more friendly to low bandwidth conditions when you stream uh, the screen scraping. So this report, as well as the integrated interactive UPI, the Unified Performance Indicator that Trevor has shown through uh, his demo, allow you to make a uh, concrete assessment of which technology, which vendor, and what kind of density can you do on a given server. Sounds good. Sounds good. Guys, let's just take a couple seconds here or minutes and answer some questions from the audience. Does that sound good? Sure. Sounds very okay. Good. Perfect. So for the first question, can you monitor disk subsystems um, performance directly? Now, what we're monitoring is the experience, the response time that the user is getting for a particular business activity. If you're talking about the response time of a disk subsystem on a local machine, if there's a WMI attribute that can be used to access that, you could. If you're talking about monitoring the disk subsystem on a server, that's a, a component that would comprise the actual response time or experience that the user that the user is. So we're not a hardware monitoring tool on, on, on the at the component level of the servers. What we're interested in is understanding what the performance of the user is in these different environments and isolating which component in the environment is the problem. And if that component is a particular server, then we would point to that particular server. That component is a disk subsystem that is not attached to that server. Um, if we had integration with the infrastructure components um, that, that were part of that transaction, you know, we could point to that as well you know, with, with, with integration. Well, perfect, perfect. Um, does, uh, does this solution have email alerts based on thresh thresholds of performance sent to the admin? Do you have that capability? You know, absolutely. So as I said, and that's what I demonstrated, is that we, have, we don't only have threshold, threshold alerts. Um, that's, that's, you know, that's, that's the easy way out. Setting manual thresholds across the organization is obviously something we support. We support something far more granular and powerful, and that's performance baselines. Those are the, the automatic thresholds that are generated by location, by transaction, by configuration, by LDAP-defined departments. So that's a, a much more granular level of detection than just threshold-based detection. And whenever we detect, there's automatic notification, both via SNMP, SMTP, and um, if you have SMS integration, you can, you can integrate, you can notify via that. And of course, notification via the report distribution of the problem reports to the, um, you know, to the IT ops. So absolutely, it's all about proactive, outbound notification of all of this information. Perfect, perfect. Let me look, we have a, a few questions. I want to get to the... Um, are, okay, here's one. Are your examples on Citrix are on Citrix? Can all this functionality work with VMware also? So I, I imagine Absolutely. maybe VMware View. It's, it's a great question. Absolutely. What I demonstrated for you today, and I, maybe I didn't, um, I didn't elaborate that on, on that enough, it makes no difference to our system if, you, if the agent is running on a real desktop from Windows 2000 through, through to Vista and, and, and soon um, Windows 7, whether it's running under Citrix Zen apps, whether it's running under Microsoft Terminal Services, or whether it's running on a VMware VDI box. Everything that you've seen applies equally across all of those platforms. And to complement what Trevor just said, there is actual code in the product, uh, for example, for the case of uh, VMware ESX, that allow us to measure accurately what is the response time. Because of the timer drift uh, that happens on VMware machines because of the lack of interrupt processing, measurements without this piece of code, measurements would be inaccurate to the level of seconds. 
and we have a special code that actually does proper measurements within VMware environments, and the same also applies to specific support to understanding what the guest-to-host mapping in a VMware box versus uh, uh, a Citrix, uh, where we also can know what sessions are running on which physical server. So we actually uh, have code for the VMware environment uh, that uh, provides this information. Well, perfect. Um, here's a good one. Uh, can, can you elaborate a bit on the specifics of virtual desktop monitoring? Sort of a wide open question, and we don't want to t take too much time. It might be a good question for a follow up answer, but uh, is it? can you give a short answer to that? Yeah, my short answer would be download our optimizing virtual reality white paper. It's not really tongue in cheek, it's, I think, the best answer. It's a, a very comprehensive 20 page document that really goes through the argument, first of all, of what the challenges are of monitoring in the, in the virtual desktop environment and exactly how we add value across the life cycle from evaluating, planning, managing, all the way through to orchestrating virtual desktop environments. And I think that's really the best place um, to start. And obviously, please contact us by email or via phone. We have to, to, to have a discussion with any of the um, with any of the, the, the folks on this webinar and drill down into whatever level of detail they would like. Perfect. And definitely, guys, I'll, I will also add a link to that white paper in the show notes. So if you're interested in, the, uh, in that paper, which you definitely should be, just go ahead to the show notes, and we'll also email that out to each one of you guys in the follow-up email that goes to as a thank you to, for attending and blah, 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 blah. So uh, I have one more question. Actually, two more questions, and then we'll go ahead and call it a, a webinar. Can you automatically take corrective action based on thresholds? Well, that, that's a loaded question. Isn't it, though? <laughs> do you want to do that, I guess? <laughs> exactly. That, that's exactly. That's exactly the answer. So it scares me. Is, you know, we'll detect the problem, we'll isolate the impacted users, identify the probable cause, monitor you know, the history and the life cycle of that problem. When you want to talk to remediation of that problem, you know, that's really something that's got to be taken at an enterprise by enterprise level and how you would want to deal with that remediation. You'd, you'd, you'd normally want to integrate with the remediation tools because obviously remediation on, a, on, on one machine versus another versus another desktop versus a server, these are all very, very different technologies. So what you would do is you would drive remediation through the detection and the analysis of the probable cause, but you wouldn't remediate on the back end. On the front end, on the desktops itself, uh, there are ways to use our technology, which, which we, we, we don't encourage, but there is a way to use our technology, you know, to do certain levels of remediation. But it's really beyond, I think, you know, what, uh, what this webinar is about or, or, or how we try to position the product. But we, we're happy to have that discussion with, um, with whoever asked it and, and understand what the use case is and, and, and drill into that. Perfect, perfect. Okay. Um, I have one more question, and this came for actually two more questions. I guess I'm going to sneak another one in. Uh, we're already over time, so it doesn't matter. Uh, so uh, somebody mentioned this as a question, and I asked this question to every single podcast and video and even webinar I've ever done, so I guess the guy uh, listens quite often to my work, and that is the competition question. So why would somebody want to use the Eternity solution versus you know, the other monitoring solutions out there? Well, because we're very, very nice guys, and they will enjoy, they'll enjoy doing business with us more than anyone else. But on, and I mean that. But on, on a technology note, um, you know, I think what's unique about our platform, as opposed to anything else that's out there, is first of all what we're able to monitor. So there are no technologies out there that I'm aware of that are able to monitor and instrument applications any application out of the box, whether that be a custom application, a Java app, a Windows app, you know, a thick client app, an Ajax app. So our ability to monitor the metrics that we collect are pretty unique, and that's both you know, from an application perspective, obviously from a platform perspective, and from a usage and productivity perspective. So that's number one. Number two, the core of our platform is built on a real-time analytics engine. So that's why we call ourselves Frontline Performance Intelligence, and we don't call ourselves an APM tool. Because what's really happening is collecting data is one thing, visualizing that data is something else, but a aggregating, analyzing, and correlating that data to identify the anomalies, the outliers, the impactors of performance 
you know, that's really the core key unique that we have. And that's, you know, I would say it's between the ability to monitor, especially in the Citrix VDI environment, and the ability to transform those metrics into actionable business intelligence through the real-time analytics engine, I think that's really what makes us unique. And I think that's why, you know, most of the Fortune 500 uh, companies out there have, have purchased our platform and are, and are getting value from it. Very cool, very cool. Okay, so last question here. Can the Eternity, um, let me make sure I read this one properly. It's another one from the audience out there. Can Eternity help organizations avoid virtualization lock-in by helping them evaluate the benefits of each virtualization platform so that they can select the right one for their particular environment? Yeah, I'm going to hand this one over to Eden. It's a, it's a beautiful question for Eden. I think he touched on it a little bit earlier, but Eden, why don't you take this one? Sure. I think that uh, when we talked about informed capacity planning, it's an offshot of not having the lockdown. The most important thing when you go, when I, when anyone goes to a vendor, is to have concrete information of how their technology works and how well the technology or product works within your environment. And by measuring the actual application's uh, experience as it pertains uh, to your environment, and their technology. That's the way where you. That's the. That's the way to avoid vendor lockdown. You are able to understand exactly whether one technology is better than another, and not by bullets, and not by advertisements, and not by conception, but actual metrics that you have, objective metrics. And that's what we're able to provide very quickly. So you install the platform. You're able to run it. Uh, to run it within your environment, within uh, the proposed virtualization environment, use your application and get uh, the informed capacity reports in order to differentiate between the different vendors. I think that's the most powerful way to approach the vendors and avoid lockdown. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so let's... Anything, uh, you know, before we go ahead and call this a, a episode, a DABCC Live episode, I guess, anything else you guys would like to add, maybe last words, things of that nature? And then also, if somebody's stuck with us through this entire hour and a half here, or hour and 15 minutes, um, what do they need to do to learn more? Well, I think to summarize, I really would like to thank everybody for participating. We see that most of, us, m most of the community has hung with us throughout the hour, hour and 20 minutes. So really thank you for your time. Uh, the best is to contact us. You, you have the information here on the screen, our website, via phone, via email. Um, we'll be only too happy to schedule a personal demonstration, a personal discovery call. Our website is really very rich in terms of the, the technical data that it has, a real full description of the product and how it works, a lot of white papers, a lot of collateral there in our, in our, in our collateral section. So feel free to browse the website if you want to get the information spoon fed to you we'll be happy to do that as well just give us a buzz and uh, we'll schedule some time with you and thank you very much Doug for coordinating this uh, it's really been a pleasure and thank you of course Eden for participating remotely at uh, wherever you are in the world now probably 11 o'clock at night so thank you for making the time as well so, pleasure. and thank you guys again and then of course thanks for everyone out there for the uh, for listening to this episode of DABCC Live. We'll go ahead and call the show. Thanks, guys. Thank you.